where does the buck stop? Okay, this is the question. I mean, uh, you like to think the buck stops on the president's desk, or at least the secretary of defense's desk, if it's something that's involving the Pentagon and national security. Um, well, the reality is the buck sometimes leaves the desk of any elected official or appointed official and, and, and <laughs> goes off to uh, New York or, or Atlanta or, or Seattle or Chicago, wherever the corporate headquarters of the, of the company is that's actually doing the work. There's sort of a debate at the moment where some people say there's a vacuum of regulation and it's absent. And other people say, oh, no, 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 there are regulations. There's a patchwork of regulations, all of which applies. There's a whole different uh, set of regulatory mechanisms that overlap in a very unsystematic way. It's not quite a vacuum and it's not quite a patchwork. What we have now is sort of a betwixt and between position where there are a bunch of rules out there which could apply. Some of them are international. Those ones nearly all have to do with mercenaries and clearly don't apply to this industry. So it's a bit of a red herring to go down analyzing them. One form of regulation is the actual contract. Those contracts often ensure that private military contractors fulfill the mission set out by the state, act in accordance with its foreign policy and national interest, but do little quite often to ensure that contractors uh, abide by human rights or humanitarian law. I always say assume you're hiring until the hunt. You know, assume the worst. Put in all the, all the safeguards and restrictions you want. These, these contracts uh, need to be supervised. They need to be overseen. We're, uh, we're, we're um, uh, operating here at arm's length or, or maybe uh, then you get into subcontracts uh, a couple of arm's length. Uh, you know, there needs to, be, uh, needs to be good information about what's, what's going on, who's in charge, who's overseeing things. And that information needs to be available to the contracting agency and, and also to the Congress. This industry is in the most public of spaces. There's no area that's of greater public concern than national security and warfare. And so when we think about how do we regulate this new industry, we've got to keep that in mind because it's not just, you know, how do we regulate new forms of banking or how do we regulate, um, you know, the internet. We're talking about regulating a new actor in warfare. And so that puts a mandate on us to do this a lot better than we've done so far. The key is um is that there's proper oversight. You know, this isn't, um, they're not making widgets, okay? I mean, they're making foreign policy. And that's something that is very different um, when, it comes to, when it comes to government oversight and government regulation. And you gotta think very seriously about, as, as, as you asked, what, what impact that has on societies once they operate. If PMCs are, are serious about self-governance, then they're going to develop some kind of criteria for selecting their clients. They're going to look at things like governance, like human rights abuses, like fiscal management, and you know, not promote the kind of stability that's oppressive. Um, a regime can appear to be stable purely because it suppresses its political opposition, because it crushes civil society, and, and you know, because, because it pockets the entire gross national product and, and sends it to a Riggs bank account in Washington. That's not stability. That's an illusion. That's a, that's a time bomb. That's an insurgency waiting to happen. So in effect, um, you know, PMCs could be promoting insurgencies indirectly by supporting regimes that have insurgencies coming to them because they deserve them. The industry is actually quite open to being transparent, and uh, and in terms of rules and regulations, uh, it, the issue is how long does it take to get those rules and regulations? Because we actually support quite a few of them that are coming out from the various governments around the world and internationally. Um, the transparency, I mean, a lot of this we can address through our own code of conduct, our own standards. If we see the way uh, legislation is going, or if we see an interest in, in uh, doing one thing or the other, we can we can address that as a as a trade association. Um, maybe the laws will eventually come out, uh, we hope so, but it's going to take a while. In the meantime, we have the flexibility to sort of address those things proactively. What we think about the IPOA efforts are that they have developed a code of conduct that is intended to apply to all of their members. And 
we've looked very closely at that code and it needs a lot of work. It's really not yet a code, it's a kind of series of suggestions based on international standards and we're hoping it goes in the right direction and ideally it will be a set of standards that will be embraced by the industry and that'll be an important first step. In every industry you have companies that do good and companies that do bad. You have Ben and Jerry's and you have Enron's. It's the law purpose to correct for that. That's why we have a law. That's why we don't you know, say, oh, companies go off and do whatever you want. That's why you have a law. That's why you need it for the private military industry. It's a further problem of accountability, the way that corporations can be somewhat malleable, right? So they can be bought and sold, they can change their name, they can restructure. We've seen that a lot with private military contractors, and it adds further to the sense that you need to have regulation that applies to all of them, that it's not enough for the companies voluntarily to say, okay, these standards apply to us, because you don't know what the company is going to be tomorrow. They're not like regular industry. They're actually, in a certain way, quite socialist, in that many of them are almost completely dependent on government contracting. Um, companies like Khaki or Dyncor, literally it's 90% or above of their contracts are from the government. So they're almost like an appendage of the government. The other thing to remember is a lot of these contracts that they win aren't competed. 40% um, of the Pentagon's contracts with private military companies had no competition. So we didn't even find out what the market could get us. But then you look at the flip side of it. What happens when they mess up? What happened after Abu Ghraib? What was the lesson that Khaki learned? Well, Khaki had its best profits ever. That's an interesting lesson. We need to look at this industry and say, right, what is it we want this industry to do? What can it do? What can't it do? What shouldn't it do? That's not happening. Market forces are dictating what this industry does at the moment. There hasn't been enough thought. I think, and I think most people think, that Iraq may be a special case, that for a lot of reasons we may not see this degree of battlefield privatization again. And I think that may be true, but even if we don't, we need to have a public debate about whether or not it's okay to do this, and governments need to be open about it. And that may be wishful thinking, because governments, for all sorts of reasons, don't want to be open about mechanisms which allow them to facilitate unpopular wars. You know, do you want this kind of atomized approach where you've got all these different, uh, you know, entities involved, or do you want the government to be uh, organized enough to really control and shape the situation? Ultimately, we as citizens, and, and we hold politicians accountable for their actions, we hold our leaders accountable for their actions. Um, and if we think that they have misused um, or, or used incorrectly these military contractors, I don't blame the contractors. I blame the politicians sitting there in the first place. But I think it's an important point to remember um, that ultimately, when it comes to accountability, um, the ultimate accountability lies with the people that we elect uh, to represent us. Almost any decision Congress makes has money behind it, and in many cases, serious money behind it, uh, from one side or another. And these are not coming from individual American citizens who become energized because of this issue. They're coming from people with a financial stake. They're coming from CEOs. They're coming from political action committees run by corporations. Uh, they're coming in some cases from trade organizations that represent thousands of companies, uh, all dealing in the same uh, uh, business. It's a mercenary culture in Washington. It's a hugely mercenary culture. If you have money, you can get things done. Or more and more importantly, if you have money, you can stop things from being done to you.